A third round of talks between Russian and Ukrainian officials will begin today. This as Moscow claims its forces will hold fire and open up humanitarian corridors to allow people to evacuate. But Russian shelling and bombings have not stopped despite other promises of a ceasefire. Meanwhile, President Zelensky is renewing calls for NATO to declare a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Let's bring in Robert Bell. He is the former defense advisor to the United States, ambassador to NATO. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Uh, so let's first begin uh, with this debate on whether or not the United States and NATO allies should create a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Uh, what is your opinion? Do you have some analysts who suggest that that would play right into Vladimir Putin's hands and allow him then to target NATO countries and even the United States? Of course, let's not forget he is the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world. And there are others who say, look, uh, this is, uh, the Ukraine has been a staunch ally and partner of NATO and the United States, and this is something that we should do to help them. Well, Vlad, I think it's important to understand there are really sort of two kinds of no-fly zones, two ways you might try to do this. You could declare a no-fly zone, put our airmen, men and women, and fighter planes up in the skies over Ukraine and hope that uh, Russia didn't contest that. But uh, hope is not a strategy when it comes to war. The way NATO and the United States Air Force, I was an Air Force officer myself, have typically conducted no-fly zones was to impose them. And by that, I mean you try to reduce the dangers to your airmen uh, before you put them in the skies. And that means you precede the, the no-fly zone with at least a day of heavy missile strikes, cruise missiles uh, and other weapon systems to hit an adversary's radars, his command and control centers, his airfields, so that when you put your airmen in the air, there's a minimum set of dangers. In the war against Serbia, for example, we launched over 750 strikes against mobile Serbian air defense radars as part of that campaign. If you don't do this, I mean, there's always risk, but if you don't do that, then there's a real danger that some of your aircraft are going to be shot down, and then you're going to have a very unpleasant situation with men and women from our Air Force and our allied air forces uh, on TV as POWs, not to mention the fact that you'd have to be striking targets on Russian soil to cause attrition among their air defense capabilities. When do no-fly zones actually work? And it's clear, you've, you've, you've clearly explained why this situation, um, it, it's not the best option. But when do they actually work? Well, they work best if your enemy's air force has basically been eliminated mm. uh, against uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq after the first Gulf War. We maintained a no-fly zone over parts of uh, Iraq for literally a couple of years, uh, but ever so often Saddam Hussein would send an airplane up or turn on a, ra a radar and start radiating our aircraft as a prelude to a surface air missile attack. Uh, in the case of Serbia, even over the course of 79 days with 30,000 air sorties against that small country, we never completely eliminated the Serbian Air Force's ability to send planes up. In fact, we had two aircraft shot down over Serbia, including an F-117 stealth fighter. So, so the other uh, news that uh, has been reported is that uh, NATO members have gotten the OK to send fighter jets to Ukraine, uh, specifically Poland, to offer fighter jets to Ukraine. The Ukrainians say many of their aircraft have been destroyed, were destroyed in the early days of the invasion. How would that process work? Uh, and uh, does the Ukrainian military have personnel to fly them. I know that they do have an Air Force. Um, and what would, what would that signal to the Russians? I think it would work, and there's broad support for it. And I'm glad that Secretary of State Blinken has said now publicly that we have said, as far as we're concerned, you, to Poland, you have the green light to do it if you can figure out how to do it. Uh, you can't just bring a Ukrainian pilot in and have him jump in the cockpit and go roaring off on day one. I'm, I'm sure there would have to be some sort of transition orientation training. The Ukrainian pilots would have to understand the configuration of the cockpit. There might be language issues in terms of uh, 
the, the training manuals for how the aircraft work, but they would be starting with a basic familiarity of how that airplane operates uh, aerodynamically. So it, it really just comes down to a way to either uh, ferry those aircraft into bases at austere sites in western Ukraine where the Ukrainian pilots could pick them up or actually have Ukrainian pilots come out of the country to pick them up and fly them back. You know, when this whole thing started, uh, the question we kept on asking was, what does Vladimir Putin want? And he kept on saying a variety of things, including um, Ukraine should never be able to join NATO. At this point, uh, that is my question to you. We know that Ukrainians and the Russians are supposed to be meeting to have these talks. Do you think the talks are sincere on Russia's part? And what is on the table? What could be offered to Vladimir Putin at this point, do you think, to stop all of this? Well, from the Russian side, I think they're sincere only to the extent that Russia would be willing to accept its own maximalist demands, which are totally unacceptable to Ukraine and, of course, to the West. The, as I understand it, the Russians are coming to these talks and saying, we want you to agree to demilitarize your whole country, to become subservient to Russia, and to change your government so that we will be confident that a new Ukrainian government will do what we want. And, of course, there's no way that uh, President Zelensky or his representatives can entertain these notions. So I think both sides have to go to the talks. Uh, neither side wants to say that they're refusing to explore a political solution. But the dynamic of the war is going to have to change even further, uh, contrary to Russia's interest, before Russia is going to start making concession offers, I think, that President Zelensky can even consider. Unfortunately, I think you're probably correct. Uh, Robert Bell, thank you very much. My privilege.